Ladies and gentlemen, our next session, the next frontier for data and AI. Um, so I have the opportunity to sit here today with Brendan Purcell, um, who we've begun working with quite closely at Forrester, and we're going to talk about generative AI. I'm uh, Chris Momberg, CTO and head of product at Zeta, and, and, and I probably have met many of you already today. Brendan, would you give an uh, introduction and what you're focused on at, at Forrester? Sure, Chris. Thank, first of all, thanks for having me. Thanks for sticking around after Seth Rogen. I am a huge Seth Rogen fan, so I'm glad that we didn't uh, overlap with him. So I'm a vice president and principal analyst at Forrester Research, where I research AI. Um, I do a lot of research into customer analytics, how to use AI and other techniques to surface insights on your customer base. But I also manage our overall AI taxonomy. What are the different tech categories that make up artificial intelligence? And the one place there where I go very deep is on responsible AI. How do we build these systems in a trustworthy and ethical and responsible way? Amazing. So uh, this is a game of me getting to ask Brendan all the questions I want answers to, and hopefully they're helpful to you as well. So starting with defining generative AI, it's a buzzword. Everybody's very excited about it or very scared about it. I don't seem to see much in between. Mm -hmm. How do you define what generative AI is? Sure, so at Forrester we define generative AI as a, a set of techniques and technologies leveraging either um, large language models, latent diffusion models that are trained using these massive, massive corpuses of data like the common crawl, the entire internet to create these models that can actually generate new content in the form of images, speech, a text, even video now, um, using just natural language prompts. Um, so natural language prompts are uh, great for some use cases. Do you think they're gonna become more pervasive in not only our day-to-day -day as consumers, but also like B2B software? Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's really the game changer about this technology is we're finally engaging with technology with computers on on our level, like our in our language. We don't have to learn a new interface. We can actually speak to the computer and tell it what we want to know, what we want to figure out. We can even tell it to munge data for us. I mean, it can do all sorts of different things. So uh, you have two kids, mm -hmm. young kids. Do you teach them how to be prompt engineers or do you teach them biology the old way? Like how, how are kids and their access to knowledge, how's it gonna change? What do they need to be prepared for? Well, that, that's a really good question. It's gonna change quite a bit. Um, I, I think that, you know, there's there's this whole, in education, there's, there's the, a, a debate going on right now. Like, do we actually block this technology or do we teach kids to use it? And I think inevitably over time, everybody's gonna be using it and the people who can use it are gonna be more productive and their productivity is gonna be accelerated and, and the output is gonna be better. Um, actually, um, BCG and Harvard just did a study on this, and the consultants using generative AI in their workflow were 40% more productive than the consultants that, were, that weren't. I imagine we'll see the same things with students. So yeah, I think prompt engineering is gonna be critical, but also having that domain expertise in biology or whatever my kids end up being passionate about. They're one in four, so maybe dinosaurs right now. Those, those are, um, th that's gonna be critical too. Like having that domain expertise so you're asking the right questions and then knowing the way to, to phrase those questions, the prompt itself. So prompt engineers with maybe some of Seth's houseplant uh, accoutrement ashtrays, <laughs> typey typey, you learn everything you need. Great. Right. Um, let's move on to industry trends. Um, mm -hmm. You have been in this business for a long time. And when you and I were speaking a month ago, you said, my inquiries are actually changing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what's been changing, what are big brands asking you about? Yeah, so in the, in the field of responsible AI, I wrote uh, Forrester's first report on responsible AI back in 2016, Don't Build Racist Models. And I've been covering it since then. And I've always had like this steady trickle of demand from our clients, primarily from financial services and healthcare, highly regulated industries, and government agencies who want to understand how to use this, but also how to how to regulate it. But it's accounted for like less than 10% of my calls with clients. Well, that all changed after the launch of ChatGPT last November. Now I am talking to folks every day about how do we harness this new technology in a responsible way. And the nice thing is, it's not just banks and healthcare providers who want to talk to me about this. It's CPGs, it's travel and hospitality, it's B2B companies. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it's, it's actually very gratifying 
to see that people, yes, they're all in on this technology, but they want to do it in a way that is trustworthy and ethical. We had a, a meeting earlier today, and um, a company that was here said, hey, we do a lot of RFPs and a lot of proposals. We actually want generative AI to help us write these proposals. And I think they're acknowledging, uh, certainly their compliance officers, they can't push all of their data, highly prized data, up into the cloud or to third-party providers. So uh, I'm guessing there's gonna be a lot more of this happening. Who do you think the big winners are in generative AI today? And what does the ecosystem look like to you? Yeah, well, the big winners today are the ones we all know. I mean, the, the launch of, of, of ChatGPT was a brilliant marketing exercise, right, by, by OpenAPI. All of a sudden, consumerizing access to this incredibly powerful new technology. And I, I say new, but it's actually not new. I mean, transformers have been around for a long time. The, the, the paper by the Google scientists, attention is all you need. I mean, that paper is um, at least five years old Six. now. Yeah. Six years old, exactly. So, but they hadn't been consumerized in this brilliant interface. So obviously OpenAI is, is winning right now, um, but there are other players out there. I mean, Google's doing its own thing. Um, you've got, um, uh, Anthropic that just partnered with, with Amazon. And Anthropic's a little bit different. From a responsible AI perspective, they have this constitutional AI approach. So they actually have a constitution of principles and rules that Claude, their large language model, checks against each time it creates an, an output. And then on the, uh, the image world, I'm, I'm excited to see what Dolly 3 can do. I haven't played around with it yet, but Mid Journey seems to be, uh, seems to be taking the pie. There's also... Um there's adjacent businesses like um, AWS has their bedrock, which allows us to build models. And uh, we were talking about vector databases earlier today. Yeah. Uh, Langchain is a company that I think is doing really amazing things to help AI be more what they call agentic. Um, you talked about Google and mm -hmm. some of the, the FANG companies. We saw a lot of moral panic early in this wave. I'm sure everybody in the room read about the, the engineer or the, the leader of AI that said, I'm out of here, this is gonna destroy the world, I'm not gonna be a part of it. But he also went to go work on an answer to those problems. Um, is this, oh God, there's a slide for this, is this moral panic warranted? So, I, I mean, I've read a lot of sci-fi, um, and so in the world of artificial intelligence, there's long been this kind of thought experiment around the paperclip maximizer. So you have a super intelligent system and you give it an ob objective maximize the number of paper clips you have. Well, it's gonna go around the world uh, collecting all the paper clips, and then it's gonna start converting raw materials into paper clips, and over time it's gonna realize, oh, human beings aren't letting me have all the raw materials I need. I need to eliminate them in service of creating all of these paper clips, and that's how humanity goes extinct, not through some sentient malice, but just ruthless optimization. That's, that's called the alignment problem in, in artificial intelligence. Is that possible? Well. I, maybe in the, in the longer term, what I think businesses should be, because look, I'm a Forrester analyst, uh, that, that wouldn't just be bad, it would be super bad, to quote a, a Seth Rogen film. <laughs> but I'm a Forrester analyst, I don't have a lot of, of leverage there. What I do have leverage is over how, how enterprises adopt this, and I think there's also a potential alignment problem for, for enterprises. So imagine you're, you're the Dole company, right? And you wanna increase productivity of, of your agriculture. Um, and so you create a super intelligent AI. By the way, what do they call it? Pineapple Express, right? They try to accelerate well the played. creation of, thank you very much. I've well been played. working on this for a while. Well <laughs> try to accelerate the, um, the, the productivity of their, their uh, manufacturer or, or of, of pineapples. But to do that, they actually create this great stock of pineapples, but they deplete all of their agricultural fields of their natural nutrients, and they're no longer fertile. And so it actually becomes an existential problem for them. I think we'll see that play out as these systems get more intelligent, where the intended objective of the system is misaligned with the objective function of the system, the thing it's maximizing or minimizing. So um, I get that we're all gonna get turned into paper clips or some version of Clippy. Um, <laughs> let's talk about marketing. Hallucinations is a buzzword that also came up, mm -hmm. um, you know, basically meaning that the AI was was wrong, uh, it thought something, I didn't think. It came up with a different pattern than what you needed. Um, do you think generative AI tools are quickly becoming commonplace for marketers or should becoming mar commonplace for marketers? Is, is the industry ready or is there still more moral panic in this marketing sector? 
So I think, I think they, they will. Um, we did like a, a spot survey in July and asked companies across the board and around the world, you know, are you investing in exploring generative AI, expanding your use of it? 89% of companies said they are. So nine in 10 companies are using this technology. And, and for many of them, it is for these marketing cases. But what I find when I talk to marketers is there's still not the adequate level of trust to allow these systems to interface with customers on the fly. Um, they're great for you know spinning up first iterations of marketing content and iterating upon, but there still needs to be a human in the loop at this point. What, so let's move on to transparency and trust. Mm -hmm. um, what's required, what kind of workflows do you anticipate being part of that? If human needs to be in the middle, is it on the modeling side? Is it on the creative generation side? It's um, observe and report. That's a deep cut of Seth Rogen's that apparently not many people here. Have seen. <laughs> I'll tell, I'm going to tell Seth in the green room. Check it out. Great movie. Victor got in the front row. All right. right we're Thanks, good. Victor. Yeah. Um, observe and report. I was talking to, to FICO the other day, and we were talking about this backstage. And, and they're doing something really interesting where they are actually codifying the requirements for an AI model on blockchain, um, and then they're building the model, and then they're testing the model, or evaluating it using those immutable requirements. So there's no moving the goalpost. Like, okay, our acceptance rate for a disparate impact between these populations is X. If it's greater than X, jettison the model. Um, I think that's a pretty solid approach. I think transparency also needs to mean transparency into the entire decision-making process. The thing about large language models is they're massive and they are inherently opaque. Like there's no way, at least at this point, and I think in the near future of opening up the hood and seeing exactly which neurons are firing, the weights and biases, all this stuff, 175 billion parameters, not gonna happen. But if you think about the workflows with large language models, a lot of times they're gonna be the interface layer. Like a human being is actually interfacing with a chatbot of a bank to try to secure a credit line. And so the chatbot's asking the human being questions. Well, that information will then be fed into a model that the bank uh, has built and owns that is their credit determination model. And that model actually needs to be transparent. The large language model doesn't, but the way that, it, that information is taken, used in that credit determination model, and then the outcome is, is created, the decision, that needs to be transparent. So there needs to be transparency into the entire workflow and then the actual point of, of decision. So this gets a little bit into governance as well. You talked about blockchain and being able to go back and see what the rules are. Anthropic has their creed to make sure they're not breaking any rules. And then you have legislative and regulatory bodies that are getting involved in this as well. As I look at, uh, well, maybe I'll pick on the FANG companies, one of my worries is that their ethical constraints on AI programs are actually a PR ploy. It's mm -hmm. a group of individuals, consortium, that says, yes, we can release this because I don't think we're going to get, get any bad PR. But I don't know is that the engineers are thinking about that when they're thinking about bringing data into the model. Um, so two questions. Uh, one is, what role does data play within an organization and the risk associated with it? And the second is, what do you see happening in terms of legislation, regulatory bodies getting involved in this and probably trying to tamp down some of the wild actors? Well, you know, one of the, one of the biggest differences between this moment we're in with generative AI and previous iterations of AI, because AI is a moving target, is generative AI, large language models, the diffusion models have already been trained on data. They've been knocked up, if you catch my drift, already. We'll be but. here all week, folks. <laughs> but, it's good. Yeah, that yeah. was good. Yeah, um, that, b by the data. Meaning, in the previous version of AI, like a company would primarily use its own data. Maybe it would be partnering with Zeta to get data. It would have a, it would have a lot of control of, over the AI system that it was building, how it was developed, how it was evaluated, how it was deployed. Here, you're going to be inheriting a model that's been trained by OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, Cohere, whoever. And so you're inheriting all of the vulnerabilities, the biases, and the flaws of that model. That's a big difference. Than, than before, um, and something that I think that you know companies definitely need to, to look out for, because at the end of the day, like 
I asked my, my dad this question because he was a lawyer here in New York for his entire career, and I said, look, if an AI model, if, if a company uses an AI model from another company and does something illegal, let's say it's an autonomous vehicle that strikes and kills uh, a pedestrian, who's to blame? You know, is it the, the, the autonomous driving system or is it Volvo, the manufacturer of the vehicle? And my dad, he didn't pause, he just said, the lawyers will sue everybody. Oh, and so Jesus. the question becomes, okay, how do, you, how do you stop that from happening? And, and the answer is push for more transparency. You know, hold these, these vendors accountable and ask them, okay, how was this model trained? What are the known vulnerabilities in the model? How are you actually um, measuring the performance of this model across various different, different vectors? Eventually, to the second part of your question, regulators will catch up. Um, Europe seems to be taking the lead, as they, as they tend to do, um, with the AI Act that it looks like will pass the European Parliament and probably become enforceable in 2025. And what, what that does, the, the part of the, the AI Act that I really like is it, it sets out this, this framework and it classifies as unacceptable risk, high risk, moderate risk, and low risk use cases for AI. So social scoring, right? Unacceptable. If you do that in Europe, you're out. Um, high risk use cases though, like anything having to do with jurisprudence or um, medical diagnosis or the credit determination um, case I mentioned before, there, there's a requirement for a high degree of transparency and also there will be associated metrics um, that companies will have to, have to measure. And so oftentimes what I tell my clients, whether they you know, have a major presence in Europe or really anywhere, is just start with an inventory. Like where are you using AI today? Is it AI that you've built yourself or is it embedded in some software application that you're buying? And try to match it up with that taxonomy from Europe. Is this a high risk, a moderate risk? a low risk or hopefully not an unacceptable risk use case. Because at the end of the day, the punchline is that if you are found to be running afoul of the AI Act, 7% of global annual turnover could go away like that. So let me get this straight. Um, social scoring, yeah, no go. No go. But being diagnosed with a disease is okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> it doesn't quite seem right yet. Um, all right, so I want to get on to predictions. Um, I wrote this slide a while ago. I'm not going to quite stick to it. We're going to stick to one short-term prediction and one long-term prediction. And I'm going to make you go first. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just talking about the, the AI, AI Act. I know that this isn't in 2024, but I do believe in the shorter term, once, it, um, once it's enacted and enforceable, we're going to see some big player you know, probably OpenAI, maybe Google, maybe Meta again, get fined a lot of money. And there's precedent for this. When GDPR was enacted in Europe in 2018, two months later, I think in May of 2018, Meta was, was fined $1.2 billion. Um, so I'm pretty sure that the European regulators already have one of these big companies in their crosshairs and will, will take action. And it's probably gonna be around privacy IP, you know, where they, using private data to train the large language model, or are they using other people's IP, those sorts of questions. What does that do for the smaller players that are developing at an extraordinarily rapid rate? Is it going to stamp out that innovation, or are they going to continue to kind of thrive underneath the protection of uh, Meta taking on a lawsuit, or uh, Google, or another big company? What I think actually is going to happen that's going to disrupt this ecosystem is a, a lot of the, uh, the data providers, like, like Reddit, for example, are going to shut down access to their data, making it a lot harder to train these models in, in the first place. So you're going to have that, like the, the supply for training data is going to get thinner. And then on the, same, uh, on the other side, you've got regula regulators coming in and constraining things. Um, and actually, I think, unfortunately, that means that the large players are here to stay, and it's going to be really hard to, uh, to combat them. To thrive. And yeah. that's, that's disappointing. And as I spoke about earlier today, we kind of need the underbrush to grow up, and we need the protection of some of these bigger organizations because some of the brightest data scientists and most entrepreneurial engineers I know, they don't work at Meta. They're building something with their, their roommate, you know, their young Seth, and um, you know, maybe, maybe with the housewares or yeah. home plant housewares, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, and that drives a big innovation economy, um, which we all benefit from, and we've been benefiting for a, a long time. Yeah. Big prediction. What's five years out? 
Big prediction. So if you think about the promise of generative AI, like I said before, it's that we can start to interact with technology, with computers on our own terms in natural language, whether it's through speech or text. Well, as companies roll out more and more uh, experiences using conversations, that means that the data that companies are gonna be capturing on their customers is largely gonna be unstructured text data or even audio data. And today's data systems, like this, this elusive 360 degree view of the customer everyone's pursuing, the idea of that in everyone's head is primarily based on structured data. That's gonna change a lot. And I know we hear that, you know, we often hear 80% of the data in the world is unstructured. I think that's true, but at Forrester, when we ask companies, what percent of your data is unstructured, um, they say only 28% on average of the data they manage is unstructured. And I think if you and I talk again in three or four years, it's gonna be well over 50%. Agreed, it does make me wonder uh, if that's reflective of the data they're managing or the data they have access to. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes unstructured data, data from conversations as an example, just get left. You know, They're no longer managing it and thinking about it as part of a comprehensive view of, of the user. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, I'll go next. Um, prediction for next year. I think we're going to see a lot more services that are effectively small language models. It'll be generative AI built for a specific domain. Say you're in healthcare or you're an aftermarket automotive company. You want better account support. Uh, you want uh, better engagement on your website through conversational AI or better SMS interfaces. I think it'll be easier for you to onboard your data into these systems in a very private, and secure, compliant way and engage with your customers on their terms. Um, as you were saying earlier, through natural language, something we're all very adept at. Big prediction for five years. You ever seen the movie Her? Mm, yeah. I hope it's like that, mm. uh, but I don't think it will be. Um, f five years out for marketing, uh, I think we'll f finally get to some of the promise that we've all been talking about for the last uh, uh, five or 10 years, which is really the simplicity that marketers want. Um, I not only predict, but I hope that marketers' jobs change dramatically over the next five years, and they don't have to be strictly analytical to get their job done. Um, earlier today, uh, during the, the Tabras panel, somebody said the only way to, uh, to measure something is to turn it off. That's how I know if it's working or not. If I turn it off and I see I've changed my bottom line, then, then it's working. And I believe with some of the AI systems and data systems that are coming to market, you'll have better transparency. Um, you'll have trust in the models. As we've talked about, governance will be built in. And it'll be simpler to test things from a creative point of view. Because brand building, at the end of the day, does have a certain je ne sais quoi. It's got, a, it's got the, the feeling of somebody in it. We need to create the tools so that marketers can do that. So Actually, je ne sais quoi is a great way of summing up what what humans are gonna to continue to bring to the table, like that undefinable thing that's not codified in data that you can use to train a model. I really, I, I love that. I'm gonna awesome. take that in and use it. I wanna thank all of you for joining. I wanna thank Brandon for joining as well today. Thank you. This is, this is the end. Another great Seth Rogen film watches my This is the favorite. end. And Thanks, Brandon's getting a job with Seth. <laughs>